Michelle. Daniel. OG, OG Rose. Rose. And today we're going to be talking about a series that Michelle has started on a very extraordinary um, thinker, art critic, philosopher, theologian, overall um, just great mind, Mr. Hans Ruckmacher, uh, that Michelle has started on Anchor. Yeah, so I, I just started reading his book. It was funny, you know, that day mm. that, that day I asked you like um, about biographies. Yes. I was like, I just was like, Daniel, point out some biographies in our library that you, you know, that stand out to you. Because uh, I, I just, yeah. Anyway, so then you, then you were going around the library and pointing out some, <laughs> some, you know, some biographies you really loved. And we were chatting about that. And then, you know, you saw the, the Rookmacher book. And you, even though it's not, a, it's not a biography, but you just still felt, you know, like compelled to like tell me about this book. Like, this is a really good book, Michelle. Yeah, you is. know, uh, it's a really, really important book. So, you know, you, you showed me the cover, you showed it to me and I'd seen the cover before sure. I've seen it cause you probably have shown it to me like over the years. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, but I've never really kind of like decided to, to really grab it and read sure. it anyway. So that, I remember that evening and I remember holding it and you're like, do you want me to put this back in the library? And I was like, no, no, I, I'm going to hold on to this. So I like took it and like put it down on our, I looked at it a little bit and then I put it down on the shelf. And then this is like, you know, maybe a couple weeks more go by. Mm. And, um, and recently it's, it's been interesting. Javier has been getting into like uh, learning some about the perennial philosophers. Right. And so I don't know, like uh, something I heard in a really great talk by, um, um, I guess his name would be Saeed Hussein Nasser. It's a really great lecture, really good lecture, and I really appreciated a lot of his insights. The point is, though, that Nasser talked about art. Mm. He talked about art and metaphysics. Mm. And I thought, I thought, hmm, I, I really like what, what Nasser is saying here about art. And he's making some really interesting uh, points about, about basically how art tells us something. Mm. So then I remembered, I remembered that this Roofmacher book <laughs> had to do with art. Mm. And so I was like, I'm going to go back and pick that up. <laughs> Finally, after like, you know, eight years of being around this amazing book in our house. Well, I mean, there's, granted, like, in my defense, there are a lot, in, in, yeah, in my defense, there are a lot of great books in this house. <laughs> but the point is, is like, I finally, I'm finally like, okay, I'm going to read this book, mm. you know? And actually it was, it was, it seemed to be perfect timing actually, mm. in light of this great lecture that Javier had sent and listening to Nasser and listening to a couple of the other perennial, perennial philosophers, philosophers and just reading it in conjunction with this Rookmacher book is just blowing my mind. Mm. Um, so it felt very timely. Like it was like, you know, it's funny because sometimes you think like, why didn't I read this book like X amount of oh, years sure, ago? But sure. then when you do end up reading it, it's like, it's just somehow there's like this perfect combination of things that make it a time oh, that's yeah. even more ripe, mm. even mm. more, uh, I don't know how to describe it. It just feels fitting. like it's it's more fitting. Exactly, exactly. So, so anyways, I'm reading this book and I'm just really enthralled by it. And I think to myself, you know, there's probably other people out there like myself who have, you know, kind of not read this great book for many years or don't even know about it. Oh, you know, I, I, mean, I had the chance it. to know about yeah. it through you, Daniel, but some people might not. And I don't think it's a name I've ever heard before. Um, so I, I thought, you know, why not just go ahead and share a little bit about what I've been learning from the book. And that's, that's why I really, I started this series. I hope that people will learn about Rookmacher and that they will go and read his book. Um, I don't know. I, I also think it's kind of cool that he's Dutch. I'm half Dutch in a oh, sense, yeah. like Afrikaans. I'm like, Oh, like his name, it's, <laughs> it harkens back to like my mother tongue and all of that. So anyways, it, so it's, it's, it's cool. Um, I really have just j diving into the book. There's just so many insights that make me look at art, completely new in mm. a completely new way mm. a completely new way i mean i've always been fascinated in like art and art history and but it's like wow just it's incredible how somebody's articulation of something oh yeah then sheds a whole new light on even just the experience of art but one of the main things that uh, maybe we can start with is just this idea that you know art is always more than art yep, yep. <laughs> art, you know what he says is what did he say something like one of the subtitles is um art is more than the painting yeah, or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. Cause he really focuses on visual art. Um, even though he's an incredible jazz critic. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but I think that's good. It's good because the visual art is the really a very good place where you feel the tensions of the, the physical, but the metaphysical and it's all there, um, in this created, you know, on a canvas, you know, yeah. it's all there in this manifested act and creation artifact, you Absolutely. know? Um, so, so really like one of the big things that just stood out to me so much was 
I mean, and I'd heard the idea through similar concepts, like through McLuhan about like, you know, the medium is the message, sure. how there's something about the way that something has, is said, the way that something is um, portrayed that then says something else, you know, oh, it yeah. says it's actually part of the qualitative element of how something is made or how something is said that is so much a, a part of the message. Mm. Mm. And obviously, like a painting can't talk to you. But what Rockmacher says is that it it says all that it needs to say oh, yeah. in an artistic way yep. through its qualitative um, method. Yep. Um, and he said too that that basically paintings are are a human's experience and understanding of the world and reality. Mm. Mm. So when you look at a painting, you're not just looking at some. And he said this too that that art is not a copy of nature. Right. It is not. It's right. an experience. Right. It's a interpretation. It's a framework. It's a philosophy of what is reality. Oh, yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. um, and so this is important then, right? Because then, like we discuss a lot with, and, and, and unfortunately, there is kind of a dearth of aesthetic philosophy. Uh, extremely. And that's that's very... Well, to Rook, Rookmacher's point, this yeah, is very, exactly this is very, this is very dangerous. You yes. know, this is very, this is very dire, and it's it has real consequences. Well, he, I mean, he basically said, if you follow the logic that is being portrayed in art today, there is not going to be aesthetic philosophy. Um, yeah, because and it, that would make sense then. It yes. sort of follows because there's there's um, there's no meaning to the art other than the raw art. You know, there right. is an assumption that there is no metaphysical dimension, which of course is completely contradictory because the metaphysical assumptions and values of the artist are necessarily going to be part of the art. Absolutely. And so what ends up happening is if you act like that is not there, then art is this kind of um, effacement, this canceling out. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and so I thought this was, you know, the, really how he discusses that makes me think of, of a lot of questions and a lot of things, but I think it's a really incredible point that, that really, like we, like we discuss in, in our aesthetic philosophy conversations, um, art is a litmus test. Right. Yes. It's the litmus for the soul of the society. Absolutely. It's a litmus for the ethics of the society. Yes. It's 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 a litmus for what is everybody thinking? What does everyone value? Yes. What do people what do people care about, you know? Yes. Um and that is going to be displayed their 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 vision of reality, you know, is going to be displayed in their art. Yes. You know, Mr. Hans Ruckmacher is an example of one of those great minds that you wonder um, where they came from and how they existed. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the great um, ways you know that you're dealing with a great mind is if they've been forgotten. Uh, <laughs> because there's something about the, the splendor by which they shine that has to be put away for a few <laughs> centuries, you know, a few decades before people have uh, gotten to the place where they might be able to handle the light. Um, and that you'll see that with many of the great minds is like, why is it that, you know, Hegel or Hume or so on are still with us? is because, well, uh, they shine so brightly that it takes the rest of human civilization a very long time to get their eyes to the place where they can uh, see it, where they've adjusted, where their eyes can, can take it in. And Mr. Ruckmacher would be an example of that. Um, I think Mr. Ruckmacher is also an example. Um, I know Mr. Uh, Mr. Viveki, with giving us the phrase, the meaning crisis, really gave us a wonderful language by which to describe the situation where people feel like life does not have meaning, the mental health crisis, and so on and so forth. Uh, but Mr. Hans Ruckmacher was absolutely well aware aware of the coming meaning crisis and was pinpointing it as you're as being able to see that it was coming due to the nature of art in the society today I, it is very difficult to read his um lectures on what is reality his lectures on art etc um and not see him constantly going hey a meaning crisis is coming even though he did not have that language and of course you have you know victor frankl very famously on meaning and the need for meaning but mr hans ruckmacher was very very aware of this problem um mr ruckmacher makes a distinction between um quality and quantity. He's going to describe a lot about how human experience and human life is primarily a matter of quality. Uh, we don't really go around our life counting, measuring, putting things in terms of quantity. Um, but really, we experience things as quality, as um, in his lecture, uh, what is reality? He's going to say reality is fact plus meaning. Uh, reality is fact plus meaning. We never live in a world of pure fact. And so therefore, reality is primarily for the human condition a matter of quality, of meaning, of color, of feeling, of value. Values. And he also very critically understood something that you see in like the work of a, the sociology of a Peter Berger, a Reeve, a Hunter, and so on, is that a society is organized by its 
values, which are non-physical, which are metaphysical, which are invisible, and they are the organizing principles by which people live their lives. And without those, it's chaos. And what ends up happening is people um, fragment off into individuals, atomize, all these different things, which everyone talks about now in the meaning crisis. And Mr. Rupmacher was saying, this is what will occur. And what he understood is that you could gauge the health of a society's metaphysical abilities and skill, if you will, and their ability to assent and create values and follow those values by the, by the art of the society. And if the art was failing or was starting to depict something nihilistic or was becoming anti-values, then that meant the society as a whole was becoming anti-values. Um, we have that piece on Plato um, talking about forms, and we talk about forms as being like the orbits planets follow, the or formulate the um, the um, organizing principles of a society. So the form of a cup is not um, so much the perfect cup, but the orbit per se, the tract by which the object of a cup follows to be itself and to become its full self. Right. So values, if we're going to use that language here, which you can assess with you know ascribe with meanings and so on. Values are what human beings need and societies need to have a tract, uh, a road, an orbit on which to formulate and to follow. Without that, society becomes impossible. And also human beings can't be intelligible to one another and they can't understand one another. And he understood that art was a kind of litmus test, as you said, to determine the health of the society in those realms in its formal realms, per se. Um, and, and also, quite critically, like you say, a painting is not a mere photograph. Um, all paintings are, a, are primarily in the business of human perception and human experience, which means that they're going to point to what humans believe experience points to. Uh, and if you think that the experience of the world is to the glory of God, um, well then, for example, your paintings are going to be to the glory of God. Um, if you think that... Um, human beings uh, are are able to experience things that animals cannot experience, uh, well, then there's going to be some sort of aura, maybe, uh, to use language from Walter Benjamin, that is going to be in a painting that you can't find in a photograph. Um, and M Mr. Hunter Rookmacher saw a society that stopped believing that there was anything more going on in paintings, that there was anything more going on in art. And he was fully aware that that would have um, implication, practical implications. Uh, practical, that's the funny thing, is the, the way a society relates to art has practical impacts on how the society formulates. Because art says something about the forms by which a society is organizing, and that thus impacts the practices and practicality of that society. So the death of art then becomes the death of the practical. And yet the irony becomes that there can be the death of the art in the name of being more practical. Yeah, no, that's that's all really good, Daniel. Um, yeah, I, I I I think that's quite right. That's quite right, and I, I it makes me wonder a couple of things. Well, one, I'll bring up one more point on that that stands out to me from Rookmacher when he was talking about how there's this tension between like does the artist does the artist stay true to what they see or do they stay true to the meaning of what they see mm. in in their illustrating, which I thought is a really interesting point. There's there's definitely questions of like even see see because the thing is the metaphysics the, the metaphysical uh spirit of the age but also the the metaphysical understanding of the artists themselves is going to mm. is going to is going to play an impact or is it's going to play a role in what they paint and how they paint okay because mm. even if you know it's like okay um you've got you know fred he's going to paint this apple okay so fred looks at the apple and he chooses he makes basically valuations mm. And valuations come from some type of ordering or some type of, you know, hierarchy mm. creation, mm. you know, because it's like you, even if we, if we, even if we don't want to think about it in terms of, you know, religion or God or something like that, you still make valuations exactly as an artist. And that's coming from a metaphysical. Yes. You might not be able to explain it exactly, yes. but it's coming from something that you think or feel or have some sort of propensity toward, yes. or have some sort of valuation of. Yes. So if you look at the apple, you know, you Fred says like, okay, I'm going to choose to, what, why does he highlight certain things about the scene or not? Yes. Why does he choose to abstract the apple or not? Why does he choose to, you know, render it exactly? Why does he choose this type of, you know, why does he choose this like intonation mm. of red versus, you know, or hue of red or whatever, uh, versus another right. color or whatever? Why does he even keep it red? What, what if he keeps it, changes it to a different color, you know? Right, right. 
what if he makes the apple multicolored? So it's like all of those decisions I think are very interesting because this very, you know, what's manifested on the outside, which ends up being like his practical decisions come from his his valuations of thought, his... Absolutely. And that's a type, I mean, even that is a, like a type of metaphysics. It's a type of, I can't explain to you why, or maybe I can. I have this, this structure of like, well, I, I abstract all my, my, my still lifes because I want to say something about stillness or like I want to say something about uh, reality. I'm trying to say something about it well, in terms of abstracting it even. Well, so, so, so I just think that's always important to remember and why I think art is such, why art ends up being this litmus test is because it's such a place of creating out of nothing Yes. that then your valuations show up. Well, critically, basically judgment always has to be metaphysical. Yeah. Like if you judge that X is better than Y, it must be based on some standard right. that you have internalized. Some that, philosophy, some, some philosophy, some understanding of, that of then what... is it. Now, critically, metaphysics can be informed by physics, but it cannot be reduced to physics. Sure. Um, you know, uh, physics, another way, the word meta can mean self-referential, right? So an apple cannot refer to itself. If an apple wants to refer to itself, that would be an act that transcends the physicality of an apple. So the moment a human starts thinking about how an apple relates to an apple or how to paint an apple as itself, then you are talking, you are talking about a self-relation of a physical object to itself that is not possible in pure physicality. Now, that doesn't mean that it's dualism. That doesn't mean that the metaphysics has nothing to do with the physical, but a, but a valuation um, is not located in physicality. You cannot find values or, you know, I was talking about the term quality, uh, which quality is inherently value because you're saying this is a quality of it and it's a characteristic. There's a funny play there where quality, like it's a high quality, but also quality as in color. Uh, these things kind of go together. So when the artist in, is in the business of quality, the fact that they say to give the apple the quality of the color red is also a judgment that that is the most that is the best color to use well, in exactly, that circumstance. Exactly, like you, so the word quality yeah. in the artistic context is always the double meaning. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the human context or the physical quality might just mean the physical composition meaning. But the key is that when an artist deals with quality, it always has this double meaning. I think that's a great point. I think that's a great point. Yeah, it's it's it kind of makes me think a little bit of like the. Um, Islamic understanding of names and attributes mm. of God, mm. because it's like, okay, it's not, it's, you know, a quality is like, this is red, right? But right. like you're saying, there's like the other meaning of quality, which means I chose red as yes. the, as what I want this apple to be, or yes. I, yes. I believe this is the best for this apple yes. to be. Yes. And that's the same with, with the names of God or the attributes of God, mm. because the attributes of God are going to be his, by his names, right? Mm. So those are technically like a quality. Mm. But then there's also like a valuation of that quality. Well, and it, this thing is the act of creation. That's why what was important that you were saying is that the moment you're creating something, all creation of qualities are inseparable from a sense of quality. Yes, um, exactly. What the meaning crisis, what Hans Ruckmacher basically was getting at, he's like, hey, basically now when we talk about qualities, we only mean it in the single sense, the physical as in characteristic, and we're forgetting the evaluation sense, the value sense. Yes. And basically that means all values will be lost. And once all values are lost, you have no formal principles by which to organize the world and everything will become unintelligible to people and people won't be able to relate and they will atomize and wait a minute, that sounds like 2022. Mm. Um, and yeah. so he saw all that. Um, yeah. So in art, yeah. quality always has a double meaning. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, absolutely. And he was very, I mean, what he was writing this book in the 60s, you know, yeah. this, this particular book. And yeah. it's just, it's just so, you know, he's just so, so in so so able to see into his own times and then into the times we live in today oh, yes. um and I, I i guess i was also thinking as we were talking about what does this mean now because he does use that language of like it's not a photograph right it's yes. a painting a painting has a philosophy right yes. so i guess i'm just thinking a little bit more about okay so now we've also talked about this idea of like valuation right yes and maybe there is this idea of like, well, look, guys, valuation always just leads to people oppressing each other. It can. And well, but that's what a lot of times that's why a lot of people want to tear down values and traditions yes. Yes. because they're like, well, this is hurt. This has hurt people. Yes. This has been yes. like stifling. Yes. So, but what's ironic is that actually the artist is one of the most expressive 
it's such an expression of the free will and yes. of, of freedom because yes. like, you know, the blank canvas, all of that great yes. work that you've done on that topic. But it's like you, you have this ability to just express whatever it is that you, you want to value. Right. Mm. So the irony is actually to take a, to strip all values is to allow for no expression in the yes. name of being more expressive. Yes. Like to be able to be released and, and able to be completely expressing yourself. You've, you've taken away the very things that even afford the ability to express, which is valuation. And it is true. That is true. And it's good to be, uh, to scrutinize and to be rigorous with how our valuations um, and hierarchies oppressive and, and dangerous and risky because they, they certainly can be. But it's like you, you don't, wanna, you don't want to end up throwing the baby out with the bathwater well, by, by saying like, okay, valuation can can oppress so then we shouldn't have any of those things but we're still going to have those things because the thing yes, is we're basically yes. like we are always going to be evaluating creatures yes. always yes. always yes. so we so it's, it's honestly it's kind of there's something i don't want to say foolish but like there's something that is just impossible about eradicating the valuation from yes. humanity so now in, instead of doing that which which honestly does lead to just the chaos yes. it leads to chaos it yes. leads to nihilism yeah. or i mean that's the the like yes. the extreme of it but it, yes. it, it certainly can it certainly yes. does it's to understand how to properly order the value right yes. so that the so that the value doesn't end up oppressing and does act does ultimately lead uh, you know, human life to flourishing, to freedom, which is the, the, I think the act of art itself is such a embodiment of the flourishing and freedom. Yes. It, it's the, it's the classic problem, um, givens and releases belonging again. You know, if you have givens, they can be, they can cause the banality of evil on sure, art and sure. oppression. Um, but if you have too much releases where there's no givens then people are unintelligible to one another, they are existentially overwhelmed and turn to totalitarianism. Sure. Values can be used to oppress people, um, because we say this is right and this is wrong and that can be used to oppress people. But if you have no values and people don't know what is right and wrong and critically, they're still going to operate according to some idea of what right, is right, right and wrong. Exactly. It's it's like but it will not be but it will not be intelligible to them because they're not allowed to think of it in terms of right and wrong it's the same yes, where if exactly. you get rid of if society doesn't have givens well people still have to function as if they are given so they're still and going they still to, will function they as still, if they are given even if they don't like you said i think that's such a great point they can't even use that language yeah, so then like, it becomes well, pathological right, exactly. that's what ends up happening you're denying a thing that you use and you have to keep using it while denying you use it and it all becomes crazy mm -hmm. and that's what ends up happening everything becomes dysfunctional um well you know i think it's in his lecture um and, and it's also there's the uh, zen and the motorcycle the art of motorcycle maker so that talks in the guy that guy uh, robert picks i can't remember his name he wrote another mo book Prisk, I think, where he talks about qualities. Yeah, it's over there somewhere. Um, on qualities and quantity and how this was a really um, important um, problem to, to sort of understand. And, uh, well, and the other thing that Hans Rockmarker in his um, lecture, uh, What is Reality, has he starts off talking about how, you know, it used to be uh, that your grandparents, uh, you know, they would go on the same vacation every year, you know, to the <laughs> same place and they'd say the same people and they'd walk down the same path and they would do this for years and years and years. And, um, you know, one day they're walking down the path and they say, hey, where's that tree? What happened to the, the oak tree? And somebody says, oh, well, you know, there was a storm and it fell over. And they begin weeping. And the point is like, is that's the kind of life they used to live? You know, that was a sort of experience that they were able to have from this kind of commitment to a certain rhythm of life, to a certain... Mm -hmm reliability of life, that they would notice every single detail and every detail would matter to them. And something that Mr. Rukamaka understood that was occurring is that people had new vacations every year. They didn't revisit the same place. They would travel to different places for new experience. And he would say what's happening is as we're losing a, as we're losing metaphysics, frankly, as we're losing philosophy, and therefore we are losing a um, ability to think in terms of quality and values then people are still going to be looking for qualities and values. But the way they tend to do that is in terms of the horizontal, the new. They look for new experiences. And he says the problem is that without um, metaphysical ability, uh, experience can never fill that void. The, it can temporarily seem to, almost like a Federal Reserve monetary policy that gives you a, a temporary stimulus, um, because it feels new and has a new quality that you've never seen before. Uh, but eventually those are going to run out. 
and your society will have seen all the new places and they will never be and and then they'll be done and then you'll have your meeting crisis so he kind of also set a sort of um clock ticking he's like once the new experiences run out that's when the for the globe per se you know once uh once the image i think he talked about even the tv he's like once everyone's seen everything you know that the the fact that there's still new places to see will function as a sort of um d delay the experience of the meeting crisis but once that occurs you're going to then have to face the reality that you've lost the ability to experience things meaningfully to experience them in a deep way and that's when the meaning crisis will be extremely bad. And that's exactly what occurred. That's what's really remarkable with this man. And um, that he, he gave you kind of, he's like, this is what will happen. And, um, and it is very, there is a trade-off between um, new experiences and seeing new, which we're not saying are necessarily bad. But there, there is a sense in which when you had this sort of rhythm to life, everything had a kind of deepness to it. You were going to the same things? Yeah, the same things, the same places, the same trips. It became a yeah. tradition. It became something reliable. It became a given. And so when the given changed, it was really deep and really meaningful and really powerful. And basically, if we're not going to have ways of life of which the very way of life itself uh, requires us or leads us to seeing it meaningfully even if we don't have a, a doctrine of metaphysics that we've consciously thought about. It would just be the way of life itself would create a sense of meaning. Well, then now it's really important that we consciously um, come up with a, dare I say, new philosophy or philosophy of glimmins, glim glimpses or a new phenomenology by which we own this task uh, because we live ways of life now of which does not, in the very air we breathe, create a sense of a sacramental ontology. Yeah, no, I think that's all really good. And I think I think that something that stood out to me with what you said was this idea of when you do the repetition, mm. when you do when you allow yourself to be there, you have to kind of like trust that you will experience something that is so that is so transformative. Mm. Even though it's odd, it's ironic because it's like, well, you're doing the same stuff, you know, like, yes. how's that really going to change you? Right. But somehow it's actually that, that like just radically changes you in, in, and just really challenges you, but also is like, wow, there's actually, I'm, I, you just kind of have to say, I'm, I'm, I'm going to see it through because I know that this is, there's something here. There's something yeah. here that, that I, that will be, that is transformative mm. and that is profound and that is, and really the profound comes from the going deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. Where, what, where, how do you do the deeper? It's to stay in one spot, but continue to dig, dig, yes. dig, 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 right? And it's like, there's something there that's like you, you get to continually build that movement in that, in that profundity. And there's something that is so, so rich there. Yes. Um, but often it's thought of as like, I, I guess, same old. yeah, the same old, same old, or boring, or like, you know, well, there's nothing like novel to that. Um, but really like you start to realize that, well, well, guess what? Now you have to start to make the novelty in a sense. Like, like there's something about learning about the change that has to happen within yourself more. If the, if the external is not going to be the thing that's changing all the time, suddenly like, Oh wow. Now I need to allow myself to change. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and then, so just the idea of being able to s stay in, in a constancy and the, and something that repeats, but yet finding some something truly profound that you really couldn't find elsewhere. Oh, yeah. You just really could not because the thing is that in constantly new experiences, you can, you will get something else, but what you can't ever get from the horizontal as we talk yeah. about, right? Like the, the constantly like having to go to the new experience to feel right. something is that you just simply cannot get the, the, the horizontal, depth really um and it that, again that doesn't invalidate the horizontal experiences you know the, the going to different places every right. year for your vacation to right. your example right um again there's something that can be really really beautiful and life-giving about that um but there's something about like when when i think it's a shift in reliance like i think there's a there can become a reliance on a new thing a new thing a oh, new yes. thing a oh, new yes. place a new place a new place a new person a new person yes. you know and it's like well when you make it about like always the new the new thing or the new place, it's it becomes that reliance is what does not allow you something that you could only ever get in actually the the sameness. Well, I mean, you <laughs> and don't. So, and so it's like you you. It's kind of like I think those those the horizontal things can be. 
I almost want to say like they're like sprinkles or something or like a cherry on top. It's like they can be wonderful things to experience and do. Sure. But at the end of the day, the same, the constancy of the, the, what you're building. Yes. The sameness, the constancy, yes. the repetition. That is, that it has to be the primary. Well, um, it is very hard to find a religion that has rituals that aren't repetitive. Right. And there's some revelation there. There's some Absolutely. secret there. Oh, yeah. um, you don't see rituals tend to be the same Eucharist or the same prayer at the same time at the same day, say in in Muslim cultures. Um, why? You know, you don't yeah. really. It's there's almost yeah. a sense in which ritual cannot be novel. Like a novel ritual is impossible. <laughs> a novel ritual is not a ritual, right? Yes, like, there's a, sense. there's a strong sense, and there's something about ritual that that it is pivotal for the sacred. And also there's something about the loss of ritual, ritual that is critical to the cause of the meaning crisis, that is causing the meaning mm -hmm. crisis. Um, you know, you could say that six days of the week are horizontal and say one day is vertical. You know, the day, Sunday, the day you go to church, you know, that there's this real sense in which, sure, the horizontal is not bad, but there's something about the horizontal that naturally doesn't even want there to be one day of the vertical or five minutes of ritual. It wants to to take it all. That's that's interesting because, you know, if you think about it from like even just a bodily experience um, perspective, yes. you know, uh, well, your sleeping time, which is your horizontal time, yes. is much, much less than your vertical time yes of walking i mean you know arguably sure. sitting could be questionable but you get it like you know sure. it's upright it's upright sure the upright time which is the vertical positioning is more time than our horizontal time and i think we should look at the things of our bodies and our our mm. circadian rhythms if you will and and sort of glean from those because what what that's saying is that like yes if, you know there's a place for the horizontal time yes but there's but the majority the 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 large percentage of the day is going to be the vertical well it would suggest that the vertical is critical and that if you don't have any day of the week that has vertical consideration then you're not going to be taking any consideration of what the majority of your life is going to be um exercising or yeah. standing upright um so yeah there's something about ritual in a very weird way Art is anti-novel, which is strange because we always associate art with being novel and new, but actually, no. You look at a painting and the novel is gone. There it is. The trick of art is that you keep staring at it, that you actually take it in, that you... Um, there's a guy that wrote that entire book um, on the um, prodigal son where he got a couch, you know, a chair, and he sat down and looked at that painting for like eight hours or something. And, you know, Rookmonker basically says something quite similar, is that art is experienced in the... precisely when the, when the new, fresh experience of the painting wears away. Once that's gone, now you can begin to finally see the painting. Uh, because now you begin to explore the depths of the quality. Uh, and so it's kind of funny because usually we think we associate creativity and art with new and different and never before seen. And that's true. But the the moment it's created, it's now there and it is now experienced. And the problem is if we exist in a culture that is drunk on the novel, then we start treating art as that as being mainly about that initial moment of seeing it and thinking it's neat. Well, and that's why I probably like, so this is great. There's so much in what you just said, so much. And it's so true what you're saying. Uh, it, it makes me think also of like, you know, you can really, that's when you start to really see the art. You know, you said that, like yes. as the novelty wears off. Yes. Well, because we have like, <laughs> I think we do have a novelty drunk um, yes. culture. Yes. yes. And this, you see this play out a lot in relationships, you know. Oh, yes. I mean, you really have to get past the novelty yes to really actually be able to see a person yes and to be able to understand them and actually in a meaningful way love them you yes. know um it's, it's past the novelty um and when you really i mean and that's where it's kind of like well when things get <clears throat> when things get just uh you know when they're just like normal life or whatever like the, the day in day out it's like well, well how, then you really see the person and that it's 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 interesting like you're saying it's it's like the art exists and therefore like your full immersion in it and experience of it comes in actually the these repeated seeings of it yes. right and then it's like well oh no but does it just become ordinary well no this is where the the inside work has to be i think personally it's like i just keep on thinking of this idea that you make the novelty yes you make the novelty you see the novelty you see the newness in somebody that you've seen, you know, for 50 years, right? Like you yes. think about like our parents or, you know, like you, people know each other for so long. It's like, but they, they still, they are kind of challenged to do something inside 
that then allows them to see something they've seen many, 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 many times uh, in a new, it, almost in a new way or in, or in a way that is like, this is so deep. It's so profound yes. because I've seen it and I know it so well. Yes. And yet it's still, it's still going to do something that maybe could like kind of surprise me or <laughs> that could kind of like, that still, that still captivates me because art ultimately is like, if this is a beautiful painting, I think about like Rilke, how we, he would go to Cezanne's um, exhibition like every week or like it was a, a lot of time he went like for a long time for like right. months on end he would go every day or something like yeah. that D don't don't quote me on that yeah. but but he basically just spent a lot of time with Cezanne's paintings and it's like you you keep going back for a reason right like right. you keep on wanting to look for a reason right and and so it's kind of like now you're really appreciating it in a sense now you're really admiring it it's not just for the novelty it's because it's like now you're actually seeing its beauty you know? Well, another, you know, a few things. One, it's very important to understand that boredom is a rather modern phenomenon. Um, we start, there's a book, um, Patricia, Dr. Patricia Spack, maybe, on the literary history of boredom. It really doesn't show up until just a few hundred years ago. It's very new. Boredom is quite new. And when you talk about, like, today we're so afraid of the ordinary. Oh, the ordinary and, oh, the same old. All of that is a fear of boredom. All of that underwriting under it is a fear of boredom. Yeah. Um, it is very difficult to get bored if you take seriously that all of reality is pointing to some higher reality. Yes, um, yes. You know, if all of reality has a metaphysical yes. secret, if you will, mystery, yes. depth to it, then boredom doesn't make sense. Boredom and the depth of metaphysics are strongly tied together. Absolutely. And a me in the meaning crisis is... Basically boredom. Is basically boredom, or a kind of or boredom, kind or of the boredom. anxiety of boredom, or the um, horror of boredom, you know, these yeah. different things. But there's something about boredom that is strongly tied to the death of metaphysics. And again, Mr. Ruckmacher is basically saying to you that you can, you can gauge, you can follow the history of boredom with the history of the loss of the, of the, the, uh, the belief of the metaphysics and art, right. if you will. Right. Well, and another thing that's just been totally ringing in my head this whole time is this idea of the photograph. Yes. Because now we live in a photograph society. We live in, in the, the, yes. the snapshot, the, yes. the novel. The, it's all commodified. The quick, 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 yes. you know, one picture after another, yes. picture after another, picture after and another. We don't even picture. look at them. I mean, people well, have hundreds of photographs that they store. They don't print them out and put them in albums. It's, that's, people don't sit around going like your grandparents did, like going flipping to through flipping old through old albums. albums. Yeah. Once they get the neat post with the likes, they look for the next one. I mean, well, it's, it's all commodification. I, that's funny you say that because I, I was like, um, I was over at mom's house mm. and just looking at you know, these photographs that in her house of, of family and oh, like, yeah. you know, you went you and your little boy, yes. the brothers and like, just, it's funny, you know, I've seen these pictures so many times, but yet like, I still, I still sometimes see them. Like, it's just, you look at them and you're just like, oh, that like, you just want to look at it. Right. <laughs> you're just like, oh my gosh, there's like mom when she was a teenager. Right. Like, you know, I just, you just look at these pictures and you're just like, they're there. And it's, it's not about like novelty at all. It's about like, this is like this is pointing to like generations. Yes, <laughs> this is pointing yes, to like yes. the generations of this like family. You know, it's it's wild. Well, and, generation. And, and like you're I mean, saying like genera even yes. the idea of generations is like it always to me. I think of generations as something metaphysical. Absolutely, uh, because yes. the past, present, future is something you can't put your finger on. No, right? it can't be reduced to the physical. Exactly, it, exactly. So so it's just interesting because now it's like this. This also proves a novel a novelty drunk society where we have social media click you know clickbait yes. like photograph you know it's just constant like photograph photograph yes. photograph and it's like one and done you look at it it's done next one yes. look at it done next one you know the scrolling yes. reels all of that fits into this yes. and and the main point is like you don't actually sit with something for very long at all no uh well if you it's really important to get in your head that novelty and art are kind of opposites well and that's a very inter i really love that you brought that up daniel and i, I was kind of like hmm that's that's very interesting, but I think I think that you're absolutely onto something. And and with how you described it, it's like oh, fascinating. Now I get it. Now I see. And well, what's interesting too about that is like it makes me think about the depth. It's like there's something interesting. It's like art is not about novelty, right? Right. But it's about mis. There is something mystical, mystery. Yes. mystical about yes. it. Yes. Mis the mystery aspect, and this is where it has to tie into the metaphysical. Well, another <laughs> okay. way to look at it, a novelty is something that the moment you see is no longer novel. You know, it's gone. Because once you, like, have the trip, it's like you've been there. You've seen it. It's a novelty. Why have I, why have I never, ever realized this, Daniel? That that word novel, and then, like, books. Yeah, books, books novel. are called novels. Yeah. Okay, sorry, yeah. continue. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, talk for another time. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, well, there, there's a... Um, 
there's something about when something is novel. There's kind of an irony there because, like, we're talking about it in a kind of cheap way. There is no story. So it, the very fact that there is no story, the use novel of the word novel kind of functions to hide the fact that there's no story. Because if we call it novel, we think we have a story there. We think we have a depth that isn't there. Yeah. I would tie it into that work with Lou on how I think words words get, words get used in the subconscious way to hide the the the, 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 the consciousness is subconsciously hiding from itself a lack of work while it simultaneously convinces itself it's done the work. So if we call novel things novel, it says to us that we've done depth, we've read it closely, we've gone through a whole story when we have not. That's right, when we have not. (laughs) You know, we've just (laughs) tasted it, it's very shallow. So there's a self-deception that's going on with that double use of the word, and that would get into that whole project um, with with Mr. Sturt, with Lou, um, which I think is important. Um, uh, But anyway, um, I think novel are these things where you taste them and it's like, um, and, and then it's done. It's kind of novel as sugar. And then you eat it and it's not there. Whereas art... Well, it's like, right, it's just a taste. Like, art begins when the novelty of the art ends. That's when the art begins. Like, when it really begins, when the novelty wears off. And there's actually a big problem in some respects with the very way that art is presented in museums. is because museums have so many works and they kind of encourage you to get to the next one and they're so big and you don't want to miss anything. The main ways that people see art is in um, architectural settings that portray art because of the design of the museums. I mean, you would have, um, you know, gallery show or, or show, like a single artist would be presented. That's closer. That's, yeah, I, I, absolutely. And, and the reason that's closer is because the same metaphys- the general same metaphysical dimension is present in all the works. So even if you move between the works, if they're done by the same artist, you still could see the same subjectivity at work. But when you're in a museum, you're moving between metaphysical visions so quickly that then what happens? They all feel arbitrary. And when metaphysical dimensions feel arbitrary, they feel like they're not there. Right, right. And I mean, the thing is, too, with this whole idea of art, you know, is actually not about novelty. It's about, it's about... Depth. Depth. But that, but this is why, like, it, 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 it has to be about, it has to be, there has to be metaphysical uh, dimensions behind art. Yes. Because if it was just about the flat, like, the literal, the flat image. Yes. Well... You, you could glance you, at it and you move could on. Glance at it and move on, or you yes. could just be like, you could just overlook it, or yes. you could think like, yes. Yes. but if it, but if it points to something, it is, it is actually like, in a sense, it's always still going to be a taste, because it's not actually like, if we're talking about in theological, it's not actually God, sure. right? Art is not God, sure, but it, it points to God, or it can point to God, yes. or it can point to yes. transcendence, or yes. it can point to the metaphysical, yes. yes, 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 and when it does that, when it does that. And is aware, and it kind of infuses the work itself with the metaphysical. Yes. Um, that it allows for this this dwelling with the deep. Well, you dwelling have to, in the deep. Well, you have to follow the finger. It's like if we're talking Eastern, the Buddha points to the moon. You have to follow the finger to the moon. Like if art is fingers pointing, then you have to follow where the finger is pointing, and that means you have to think. That means you have to observe. The word observe is important because it's religious. It's like worshiping. It's like really kind of taking in in a deep way. Yeah. Uh, but you're, you know, in a religious context, you would be worshiping what the thing is pointing toward, not the thing itself. Right. Um, if, if truth, when you looked at truth, if truth was undeniably true, then you wouldn't have to think, you'd only have to see. The, you know, the, the fact that truth only can be known as true when you think about it, because it doesn't tell you that it's true when you see it, you have to, to ponder it, means that you have to think, and not merely think analytically, but deeply. And so likewise, what art does is present you with a, a phenomenon that cannot be fully grasped by merely looking at it. And yet there's a paradoxical action there, because it, all you do is look at it. Um, another way to think of this is a reason why you have to look at art so long is because what you are trying to do is, in a sense, access a subjectivity, which is impossible. Um, I can't access your subjectivity. I can't enter your consciousness, right? I can only enter my own. If I wanted to try to enter the mind fully of Michelle Rose Opperman Garner, I'd have to really spend a lot of time with you. Like, think about um, the method actors, right? Like a Daniel Day-Lewis or someone. He'll, like, literally try to be Abraham Lincoln, and he'll stay in character even when he's not on stage for months, in order to really become 
um, Abraham Lincoln, or I think when he did My Left Foot, like he was, I think he stayed in a wheelchair for a long time uh, and became that character. And that's how he fully embodied it. So likewise, if you're going to really fully embody a subjectivity that is not your own in hopes of really knowing it and understanding how it sees the world and, and what those eyes see in things that are metaphysical, then you really have to spend a lot of time with it. And we know that regarding people. Right? Like, if you really wanted to know a person, you have to spend a lot of time with it. Well, the same goes with art. You know, art has behind it a subjectivity, a metaphysics, a value that if you want to know, you'd have to spend a lot of time with it to really observe it. But since it doesn't, like, speak to us like a person does to remind us that there's a subjectivity in there we need to know, we can commodify it. We can treat it like merely an object and then move on to the next, uh, the next uh, dose of sugar. Yeah, I just like was thinking how it was such a great point you said about the art galleries kind of betray the experience the art. of art. And this yes. is, I was just kind of thinking like as you're like you need to spend a lot of time with the art. I just like sitting down on one of those little benches they provide, and you're staring at like this painting, and you're mm. like, I should be thinking like about really deep things, but I'm really hungry. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's in Lewis, right? That's uh, that's in <laughs> that's the screw tape, tape yeah. letters. Yeah. 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 But, but 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 no, like I guess what I mean to say is like the 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 the, the, the prop. I think the. I don't want to say like art illiteracy, but there's kind of a, oh, yes. unfortunately, there's not really a whole lot of understanding of even how to, how to sit with a painting, like how no. to really no. uh, allow yourself to, to be able to get immersed in that, in that painting. And then let alone if the painting perhaps does not point to a metaphysics, if it is truly like nihilistic art, well, right. depending, I mean, it just really depends, but um I don't know, perhaps I guess you might be able to construct some sort of meaning out of that even. Like, you know, Merleau-Ponty says we're condemned to meaning anyway. Right, so, right. But the point of the matter is, is that uh, I think if we are able to make this, you know, incredible connection like Rookmacher has made with art and the metaphysical, that art always says something yes. more than the painting. Yes. It, it gets, I get, I think that does so much for even just being able to sit and experience art in a more profound way. Yes. Well, I mean, Hans Gadamer, the other one's Truth and Method, where he kind of talks about one of the problems today is we study history trying to get the facts but really you can if you really want to know a historic period you need to study the art because that's how you encounter the horizon of the period the values the ways of seeing and so you know hans gadamer in truth and Me method is also kind of uh, suggesting the necessity to know a place or a people you need to get into the art so you can encounter the language he will, he'll kind of talk about the horizon um and no i mean to close it 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 we don't know how to read images we only know how to read words. I think in East Orthodox, they'll say they wrote in an icon. They don't paint icons, even mm. though icons, they talk about writing it because for them, the image has a kind of scripture. There's a scripture to it. And you read icons, per se. You don't just see icons. That's Well, that's Rookmacher mentions that in the first chapter. Yeah. Like he was talking about how you read, you know, he was talking about the directionality of reading, right? Like even in Japanese, it's yes. the other direction. Yes. You know, it's... it's we, we, all, we say, but I think I think this is what what I mean though because you know I'm, I know that it's it's definitely a harken to the letters yes. to be hungry while looking at painting yes. but that the idea I think people I think there is a real there can feel a, t a frustration I think with sitting and being like I should be. well and it also comes down to shoulds unfortunately we're we're often taught like this is what you should think this is what you should think mm -hmm. this is what you should think so then you sit with something and you're like what should I be think what should I be thinking when what really it's like well what how are you, how what is it speaking to you and or what it, what what do you think what just what do you think you know or right. uh, how are you reading this and so i i i guess i just want to say like like i mentioned already it's it's probably like a secondary benefit to the book because the primary is a lot of you know maybe some of these deeper metaphysical concepts but really just like the ability to appreciate art <laughs> more and be able to actually like wow, look at art in a whole new way is, is a great thing from Rokemacher's book. And I mean, obviously, if he's a jazz critic at art, you know, yes. and obviously, like, he's got incredible insights on art, too, as an art critic, you know, it's like, uh, that's a great thing. Just to even, even, even be able to read about somebody who has that ability and be able to say, oh, wow, like, he's teaching us, basically, through his book. Well, um... Teaching it, us that ability through in, this in book. <laughs> a society that has no training that does not have scientific ability is going to struggle to know facts from um, non-facts. And that's going to be a problem. And we tend to know that, you know, we tend to hear that. But there's another side to this, and that's a society that has no training in the arts 
will not be able to successfully identify values or formal principles and good formal principles from bad formal principles. Um, And so you need both. You need both. And what he understood is that you were really losing um, the the artistic training or the ability to read images or to read art or to understand art. as being part of a metaphysical schema mm-hmm. and and mm-hmm. that meant the society was going to lose formal principle it would not be able to meaningfully or intelligibly formulate itself in a manner that people could understand and participate in without it being oppressive because the other thing is if you if you can't formulate the society according to metaphysical values which are open but closed they give you form but they're not overly oppressive you can dance right it's like a dance it's there's variation there's individuation but there is a logic right if that is not an option for your society because it does not have aesthetic training, which gets us in, to that subject and what it would constitute that, then the only way for the society to hold together is power and force and depression. So either you get anarchy unloosed, you know, unleashed upon the world, second coming yeets or something, or you get Hitler, or you get totalitarianism, or you get force, or you get giant institutional oppressive forces. So the loss of art basically just destines you the the art of the loss of art and the loss of metaphysics and all these things that are tied together because metaphysics informs art as art informs metaphysics and so on and so forth the loss of those dooms you to either anarchy or totalitarianism and so in mr in the meaning crisis as a whole and mr rockmacher understood that um very very well yeah so thank you guys for joining us and um you know i'm going to continue on with the series excellent you can find it on anchor or spotify um but again thanks daniel for having the conversation thank, thank you, you all for listening and you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Anchor, Anchor, and YouTube, all the Spotify. internet things. Yes, OG Rose. OG Rose, and we appreciate your time very much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.